So for this very short introduction to hot stone massage, I want to focus mostly on um, the things we need to know before we get to get started in lab on Wednesday. Um, so for any technique that we need uh, to learn, we need to learn anything we need to be cautious about. Um, and anytime we cannot massage uh, either locally or systemically contraindicated not massage at all. So for hot stone massage, a lot of the effects are circulatory in nature, like Swedish massage or lymphatic massage. But of course, with hot stone massage, we're adding the element of heat. So we're not going to massage at times when elevating the temperature is not advised. And sometimes that's just locally, or sometimes that's all together. So First of all, the overall do not massage, you know, hot stone at all. Uh, all the same things for Swedish massage apply. So an acute illness, like a cold or a flu, fever, um, those things. And um, then we're also going to add uh, circulatory conditions. Um, for example, um, well, actually, I'm going to say, like, if there's a, an acute, this is a little bit different, but an acute flare up of something like lupus doesn't respond well to circulatory massage. So if somebody has chronic lupus and they're used to getting massage and they know they respond well, that's different. But if they're in acute flare up, um, we're not going to aggravate that. Um, sunburn skin, obviously the stones are not okay on that. If it's just a mild sunburn, um, you know, and very localized to like, let's say just the shoulders are pink, um, then um, you could do hot stone other places. Um, but if they have like a severe sunburn, um, let's say second degree burn, which is gonna be indicated by the blisters, or it's a larger area of the body, um, then it would be better to just avoid altogether. Questions on that? Advanced or poorly treated diabetes. Um, I would definitely get clearance on folks who have diabetes, um, you know, whether the heat's going to be okay. Um, serious heart condition, this could be too much um, for them. Renal disease means uh, kidney disease, uh, same situation, and then high risk pregnancy. Now with pregnancy, um, as we talked about with pregnancy massage, overall, we don't wanna raise their overall body temperature. So we're not gonna do an overall, you know, full body hot stone massage um, with pregnancy in general. Um, but uh, a very small area that wasn't raising their core temperature uh, might be okay. But in general, we're not thinking hot stone massage. Are there any clarifying questions on that? And then um, some additional uh, conditions or issues when heat is a problem, um, obviously inflammation. So whenever there's inflammation, um, heat is contraindicated. So that might just be a local inflammation. Very common example, sprained ankle. Um, we would not want to use heat um, on that sprained ankle or anywhere distal to it. Uh, but if, if it was just a minor sprain and they were otherwise okay, and they really wanted a hot stone massage, you could still work with their back, for example. Um, we already talked about pregnancy. We don't want to raise their core body temperature. Uh, menopause, um, heat is not 100% contraindicated, but just keep in mind that a lot of uh, folks get um, hot flashes with menopause. And so that, you know, might aggravate it. Um, but that it does not systemically contraindicate it, you know, just to be aware, are they getting hot flashes? You might need to be changing the temperature or maybe not, you know, hot stone massage, really turn up the heat. So you might need to say, for example, undrape their feet or, you know, use some contrast therapy, something like that. Some medications contraindicate heat and that should be the type of thing that when the person got 
medical advice about how to use their uh, medication safely, uh, they should have been told, you know, there are sometimes some medications they should avoid sunlight. There are some medic medications where they should avoid heat. Um, I mentioned the lupus already, some other um, uh, conditions that um, the heat is not good um, locally. Um, or, or systemically, excuse me, our multiple sclerosis. I was looking at the phlebitis when I said um, locally. Um, phlebitis, thyroid disorder, and lymphedema. Um, lymphedema, they could have um, swelling on their whole body, or they just could have swelling on their legs, but that's indicative of a circulatory issue where you're not going to want to use the hot stone at all. Now, of this last list that I would say, I want to add two clarification points. I mentioned on the lupus, they might respond fine to massage and hot stone massage when they're not in an acute flare up. In, that's a condition, an autoimmune condition that goes through cycles of flare when it's activated and remission. And so sometimes they respond fine when they're in remission, but during an acute flare up, we don't want to do anything circulatory and that could really tax the system. Folks who have lupus definitely come in for massages. And so if they come in during an acute flare up, you could think about you know, more gentle and non-circulatory things, like they might enjoy some acupressure, they might enjoy some craniosacral therapy, even some compression. The multiple sclerosis can vary in how far it's progressed, how serious it is, um, how the patient is experiencing it, and what medications they're taking. So that's something I would get medical clearance on, and they should have a better awareness themselves, like is heat something that aggravates um, their multiple sclerosis. And that also can go through times when it gets aggravated more and then when it's more settled down. And nowadays there's very good medications to treat it, um, but I would still work with their doctor. Questions so far? Okay, so be careful um, when somebody has hypotension or orthostatic hypotension. Uh, hypotension is the technical term for low blood pressure. So we already talked about in the lab and showed the special draping if, you know, somebody's more prone to the low blood pressure or orthostatic hypotension. Uh, orth hypotension. Uh, just remember the distinction is the orthostatic hypotension is the kind where if somebody's laying down or sitting and then changes positions to an upright, they might get faint or dizzy. And lots of different people can have that happen, uh, but it's super common with senior citizens. And um, so I would, uh, you know, be careful um, with them. I would be careful with senior citizens and hot stone massage anyway. Um, there might be the heart conditions, the kidney conditions, the medications that contraindicate it. And then also a lot of seniors, depending on how, how senior they are, can get that frail skin. And so, you know, not so great. And also just the, the heat can be kind of too much for it. So regarding the, you know, if the client is otherwise okay, but they might just get um, dizzy when they sit up, that would be great to do one of the assists. And obviously remember, we want to drape them modestly for that. Um, and so the draping I showed the other day where you can keep them completely modestly draped, help them sit up, stay with them to make sure they're okay and then you can leave the room for them to get dressed. That's true, hot stone, not hot stone. Anytime there might be um, an orthostatic um, hypotension issue. A lot of people are aware if, if they already have that issue. And that's one of those things you can also kind of just screen out by, you know, if folks have had massage before, if folks have had hot stone massage before, then they often have a better sense of how they respond to it. Sometimes people who don't normally get orthostatic hypotension also can get dizzy if they're really dehydrated. Um, and the hot stone massage, um, you know, if they're already uh, depleted of fluids, you know, this can be 
pretty warming. There might be some sweating involved. Um, so, you know, it really is good to make sure that they stay hydrated. Questions so far? Some local contraindications. Um, artificial devices um, like pacemakers, implants, hip or knee replacements, even some metal pins and plates and rods um, can be sensitive to the heat. Um, and also with the weight of the stones, I'm, I'm pointing here in case they had a pacemaker, but also we don't want to, um, you know, dislodge it with the weight of stones. But those are areas that, um, well, the um, pacemaker and implanted devices, those would be avoided under any circumstances. The ones that we're uh, adding to the list are, you know, the things that the heat really aggravates and those can include um, you know the implants the pins the rods similarly and yet different um, is if they've had nerve damage so minor nerve damage might be okay but if they had um, a surgery or some other reason why they had a little bit more serious nerve damage um, one of the responses can be hypersensitivity to major temperature differences. Not everyone gets that, you know, that can be different from nerve, you know, issue one to the other. But sometimes say, for example, if there was a nerve damage, um, they might feel cold really intensely just in that area or heat. So something to communicate with them and be aware of. So I would just avoid it, right? Um, it not use heat, obviously, where the heat bothers them. Questions so far? Okay, varicose veins, you know, that's on our regular uh, caution list anyway. Um, with the heat and the, the stones and the big circulatory, I would say even more. But just to clarify, because I'm sure you've seen that lots of folks get like those little, you know, very subtle spider veins. Um, those are not as big of an issue. You can massage those. The ones we want to be really careful with are the big, thick, ropey um, veins. The, the big, big, thick ones might have more damage, you know, to the veins and we don't want to, um, you know, cause any further damage or, you know, possibly dislodge a clot or something like that. So those twisted, big, thick, gnarly veins you could avoid, uh, but you don't have to avoid all the little tiny, thin ones. And while you're getting started in lab, you know, feel free to ask me anytime if you're not quite sure the distinction. Questions so far? Yeah, actually, I'm not, I feel like varicose veins come up a lot, and I'm not 100% sure what the danger is there. Is it just because they're so close to the surface that they are prone to being damaged more easily, or well, I'm not really sure. One of the things is that they're, you know, they're already damaged, um, especially when we get into the big, thick, ropey ones. Um, that's already a damaged vein. So part of the issue is we don't want to damage it further. Um, there's also some speculation or that might be also indicative that there's other you know, issues possible going on with the veins. So we don't want to, um, let's say, possibly dislodge a blood clot, like take a stable uh, blood clot and then get it, get it mobile as an embolism. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, I'll probably do a little more research on varicose veins outside of class um, to make sure I fully understand it. But yes, thank you. Okay, great. And, you know, to be totally honest, some of these things are speculative in nature. So what massage therapists often do is take what we know about anatomy, physiology, and pathology, and the possible um, effects of these different techniques, and make educated, speculative, you know, guesses of what would be safest. Uh, because 
there is a lot of re massage research, but there's nowhere near the level of massage research that there is, say, for medications. You know, so if, if a company wants to, you know, make a medication and patent a medication, they have a lot of um, motivate, uh, not motivation, they, they, but, but because they can make a profit on that medication and they can patent it and own it, they have a lot of money backing all that research, right? So there are massage research organizations and individuals do the research, but there's a lot of things that, that are educated based on, you know, sort of speculative that, that I wouldn't say are, you know, I don't think that anyone's really researched that, um, but sort of erring on the side of caution, um, if that makes sense. And then the last one is common sense and you would avoid for any kind of massage, broken or inflamed skin. Um, obviously, whenever there's a break in the skin, that is an invitation uh, for infection. That's a breach in the system. That's a place where it's vulnerable. We don't wanna do any massage in there. We don't wanna introduce microorganisms, et cetera. So if it was just one small area, you could just avoid that one small area. I would avoid it like um, at least, you know, three to five inches away from it so you don't introduce anything near it. Um, if it is something, let's say they had a little cut or opening or something that they weren't aware of for whatever reason, um, you can also provide, you know, bandages and other covers, um, you know, as a courtesy that they could cover it and it'll make it easier for you to avoid it. And it'll also make it easier to keep body fluids off of your sheets. I wouldn't say it comes up too often, but you know, sometimes people have just like little scrapes and things that they, you know, didn't have um, band-aids or, or um, covers for. So questions on any of the things where hot stone massage is not indicated? Okay, so um, let me go over just a couple of the introductory kind of basics and really encourage you. I see some of you already turning in the hot stone massage homework, which is awesome. Please make sure you really watch the very short videos in this module and study the little things in this module so that we can really get started in lab right away on Wednesday. Um, I haven't required you to buy any hot stone equipment. Um, but somebody already, already borrowed a few stones and I just thought it was such a great idea that I would just put it out there to the whole class that if you wanna take a few stones home, um, you are welcome to, or they're just um, the smooth kind of basalt stones. So you can also um, buy them. So, um, you know, after our hot stone unit, you can, you can borrow them. Um, hot stone massage is, um, excuse me, let me get to a different page. I love hot stone massage. I think it's really fun and super effective and it warms up the tissue really well. It's very relaxing. You can get a lot done. I would say the, one of the biggest reasons why there's, I would say two main reasons why some people don't like hot stone massage. Um, and one of them is that it's a lot of setup typically and you know, a lot of cleanup and setup. And so, um, and then also the heat. Some people don't like that much heat as the therapist or the client. Um, Regarding how much setup there is, um, this is sort of the typical setup and it depends on your place of business. You know, um, if they have a lot of room in the room and the sink and everything right there, um, sometimes there's just all of this, there's room on the shelves and whatnot. But a lot of places, you know, this is a lot of setup and they don't always use hot stone in every room in, in every session. Um, so a lot of places actually have some type of rolling cart like this that you would literally, if you had a session of hot stone, you would literally put your stuff together and take it to your room and set it up. Um, there's some variances on in, in, in what you can buy and how many stones, um, what kind of heater to get, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna tell you a couple sort of um, shortcuts or options if you want 
to use hot stones, but you don't want quite as much um, setup time. So first of all, if you are going to have like a full hot stone session, which is the most common way to do it, um, usually it's a longer session, like 90 minutes, but whether it's 60 or 90, there is always an additional charge. If you're at like an area of town or a fancy spa or whatever, the additional charge can be quite a lot. Like you might pay like $200 for a hot stone massage. And while that may sound like lots and lots of money, um, just keep in mind, it is a lot more setup time. Um, so you'll need to set, you know, keep keep that in mind, you know, with your pricing, um, the extra time. Now that's the most common way to do it. As a whole big hot stone massage costs extra, blah blah blah. But what some massage therapists do is that they really like the hot stones, but they don't want to do this full setup and clean up after every session. Um, so what some massage therapists will do is set up the hot stones in either a professional hot stone heater like this one, or in you can just use a crock pot um, or a roaster. Um, sometimes people will use you know, that to save money. Um, and really just use like a handful of stones during the session. So rather than like 40 to 80 stones for like a whole big session, it might be like a regular massage with just using some stones for that extra wonderful warming and getting into trigger points, etc. And so in that case, as long as you're using a scoop like this um, and not plunging your hands into the water or otherwise contaminating it, if you're just grabbing out some stones with a clean utensil and not contaminating it, you could just you know set this up once and have enough stones in there as a nice little add-on for multiple clients. Now, I'll be honest, not a lot of therapists do it that way, but I do know some therapists who have enjoyed doing that. So, um, questions so far? Help. Okay. I have a quick question. If you were doing a full 90 minute hot stone massage, like how many stones would you need set up and ready for that? Yeah, I mean, I love to use a lot of stones. So in the like 60 to 80 range, however, it also depends like, are you gonna like clean your whole setup every single time? In which case you could throw the stones back in and they reheat faster. Um, but you could use, I would say as few as 25 to 40 and still do some nice stuff. But what ends up taking a lot of stones is, and you'll see this Wednesday, Thursday, is that it's nice to line the placement stones, you know, to line the back and the sacrum. And so you've got all these stones that are just like sitting there. And then it's really nice to use all these working stones too. So, but everybody has their own, you know, different kind of way they end up liking it. Although I'll say a major caveat to that is, or uh, a difference, I guess, is that um, if you do work at like one of the uh, major franchises or somewhere that has like an established protocol, a lot of places, if they have like a protocol on the menu, um, the franchises um, like Elements and um, Massage Envy or any of the major spas, um, which are not franchises, um, if they have an aromatherapy package or if they have a hot stone package, they will usually train their people in a way that they want it done. So there is often still flexibility like in exactly how you do the techniques, but they try to standardize certain things. And I'm saying that in response to your question, because maybe you're working at a place that has a very particular set of, you know, 25 or 40 stones. Um, and you're not like bringing your favorite. Like this picture here, this is my very favorite sacrum stone. I was showing someone this in the lab the other day and somebody gifted it to me. I mean, this thing is like beautiful and huge and amazing. And you guys will see it. It's like, it's amazing. Um, so you may have like your favorite stones too. Yeah. Now, one other alternate, and uh, again, I'm just kind of showing you some, talking some basics here, and then right away in lab on Wednesday, 
I'll already have my stuff set up, but right away I'll show you, you set up your stuff so we, we get that going right away. But um, another alternative people will do, because a lot of people love hot stone, but they don't love all the setup. So people have kind of tried to work out different scenarios. One that I've heard a lot of people really like is there's these travel kits of hot stone massage. And it's this cool little thin briefcase like suitcase that everything you need is in that. And it's not all of the heavy water and giant setup. And so I've heard people enjoy that. Um, it's not as many stones, but you know, that might be a nice way if you want to take your hot stone on the road. I see something in the chat. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah, like an otter. I love the favorite stones. Anything else? Okay. So we're going to take um, in this, I'm going to give you the preview to the setup. So our setup is faster on Wednesday. There's enough of these hot stone units for every lab pair to get one. And you're going to, if you have a hand towel or a face towel, put it down on the bottom. And this is where you can see in the picture, this is where a lighter color towel is good so you can see the stones in the dark because the stones are going to be gray or black or green um, or, or speckly. And um, the organization of the stones, you know, you develop your own system, but you basically keep the different sizes in different piles so they're easier to grab. So like I put my stones that are going to be placement stones along the back in one corner. I put my favorite little tools for trigger points in another corner. You can see I've got my favorite beautiful sacrum stone over there. So the exact order is up to you, but you basically organize them by size so that when you're going in there and grabbing what you want, you can find it and you're not just fishing through a mess. Questions so far? So very quickly, the rest of the setup, and I'll show you again on Wednesday, and then please watch the short videos in the module because you'll understand better what we're gonna do and you'll make more of the demo. Um, it'll go through the basics, like how you pull the stones out, dry them off, oil them up, use them. So please watch those. Um, this is where you're gonna use at least one or two bath or beach towels. One of them is gonna be to dry off your stones um, it's ideal. Well, it's not, not everyone uses contrast therapy, but it's very nice um, if you have some ice water to have the option of using cold stones and hot stones. Some places just use the hot stones. Um, oil is better for hot stone. Um, lotion doesn't work so well. You're going to um, burn off a lot of heat. So definitely bring something to hydrate yourself. I recommend, you know, something with electrolytes, whatever you like to drink, um, even if it's just water. Um, something to cool down the water, something to put the dirty stones away, uh, thermometer. Some of these have thermometers on them. And then your extra towels can be useful for things like wrapping stones around the feet and so forth. So that's the basic setup. <clears throat> and if you watch the rest of the module, it'll talk you through some of the basics, which I'll then show you as far as a demo on Wednesday. <coughs> Sorry, does anybody have any questions? Uh, in the module, it mentioned if you or the client get too warm to spray them with like lavender um, or, or I think it was citrus. Um, do you have a lavender or citrus spray that you recommend? Um, well, the hydrosols are nice, like a lavender um, rose or um, citrus. Um, the hydrosols are nice. Um, you know, Simplers is one of my favorite um, medium price brands. I think that brand now is pretty good for an affordable brand. And um, if there's any that you find that you're wondering about, I'm happy to talk to you about more of them. Um, yeah. And obviously, if you're ever going to use any aromatherapy, you always make sure with the client, obviously, beforehand that it's okay. And in our lab scenario, 
we don't really use it much because that kind of subjects everybody to it. Yeah. But it is, it, you know, the main caution with the hot stones, obviously, is that they, they can get too hot and they can, if you're not careful, I would say the biggest risk is that you might burn somebody. So we're gonna be really careful with checking the temperature of the stones and communicating with our clients to not burn them. And I'll show you techniques. The, the main one is that when you take out a fresh stone, dry it off, oil it up, check out the temperature. The main thing is those fresh hot stones you're gonna keep moving. So we're not putting the fresh hot ones still on the skin because that'll get too hot yeah anything else and did that answer your question we went over a lot of reasons when not to do it what are some good reasons to do hot sun massage yeah great question so um you know it's super super relaxing it's commonly like a spa treatment it can be super pampering i mean i've had hot stone massages where you know, they just have you on this extra cushy table and all this extra cushy stuff. And it's just this long, luxurious, amazing treatment. I find as a therapist, it's relaxing to do. Um, but the other thing is it really melts the tissue fast. So it really expedites that thixotrophic effect. So when you get the hang of what you're doing, you can actually use it to get more work done quicker. So for example, you can even use it as a warm up, uh, you know, before treatment work or even use it to do treatment work. Like you can use it with MFR and because it's speeding up the thixotrophic effect, you're just like, whoa, things are melting, right? It's very cool. And similarly, you can even use it for neuromuscular therapy where that heat can really aid the speed which you can get rid of those trigger points and so forth. So while I would say more people use it for relaxation, you can really use it to, to work, um, you know, to, to, to get the stretching, to lengthen the, the um, tissue, to speed up the thixotrophic effect, get that MFR going, get the trigger points going, use it for acupressure. Um, yeah, yeah. Great, um, does that bring up a follow-up question? Okay, cool. Um, anybody else? Okay, so for lab on Wednesday, and this is in your calendar, just make sure that you bring at least two to four um, bath or beach towels. That's required. Um, it's okay if it's literally your bath or beach towel, as long as it's clean for lab. And then optional, but very useful, is if you can also bring um, hand towels, again, two to four. Um, blankets are always optional, but it's nice. And um, then just really do bring something to drink. Um, if you have a closed container um, of water, we can make sure that there's an area of lab where you can take turns for hydration um, because as a massage therapist, um, you're definitely gonna feel working with that much heat. And if you were a massage therapist, like just in one room all by yourself, like just one or two treatments a day, maybe not that big of a deal. But when, if we have good attendance on those days and we've got like, five to eight of these all going all together all day, it turns the um, whole lab into this like tropical butterfly house. And um, I think it's really lovely. I enjoy the heat and it's, and it's beautiful and relaxing and so fun to work with the stones, um, but you're definitely gonna wanna stay hydrated. Yeah. And we might need to open up the doors too, right? If you guys get too hot, especially with our extra COVID gear on. Yeah, cool. Well, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a great add-on. Um, and if you don't end up liking it, that's okay. It's not something you're required to do, um, but it's, it's a great thing to know how to do. Um, so anything else? I'm excited, thanks. Cool, 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 cool. I'm super excited too. All right, well, I'm gonna go after, uh, after this job, I'm gonna go to a massage job after uh, school today. So I won't be on Canvas till later today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm excited. I can't wait. Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks so much, Z. Bye, everybody. Tomorrow on Zoom for A&P and PATH, but Sharice will be there too.
All right, see you tomorrow. Good job, see Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.